Okay, colleagues. Good evening and greetings. So... Unfortunately, we are in the middle of a cold and dark November, on quarantine, sadly, tragically. Let's hope we'll be back in classrooms in January. I really miss your company, colleagues. Just a moment of mindfulness before we begin. Nur der verdient sich Freiheit wie das Leben, der täglich sie erobern muss. Yes. Maintaining mindfulness is a daily struggle. Daily struggle. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about Heidegger and Lacan today. Maybe a little bit of uh, uh, Freud and Marx as well. Well, you, you remember uh, Nietzsche, uh, Marx, and Buddha are the three guiding philosophers for me this year. So, um, first of all, if you want a more uh, classical style lecture, I think in the course right now we should be doing Marx, so I could recommend um, either my uh, lecture on Coursera or one of my lectures here on the YouTube channel, uh, which is which whichever you find more more convenient, whatever. I feel that probably Coursera one is going to be more uh, coherent. But in many ways, Marx is a very challenging philosopher, and I feel uh, I need to find proper language to explain Marx. And again, Nietzsche, Boda, and Marx. I feel that in order to explain Marxist insights properly, they have to, Marx has to be read through the lens of both uh, Nietzsche and Buddha, which is not an easy thing to do. I'm not sure I have succeeded in doing that on Coursera. I tried, but I'm not sure if I succeeded. Anyway, um, so let me, let me try to get to Lacan and to Heidegger. Uh, <clears throat> so the immediate occasion for this lecture, and by the way, uh, after we're done, we, we're done here. I'm going to go to Teams, and if you have any questions, we're going to have a live Q&A in Teams. Um, so the immediate occasion for this little live stream, I guess, is uh, a question which Ivan has asked me this morning mm. about Epicurus. Mm. And for me, Epicurus is a very interesting philosopher because uh, Epicurus and Buddha, in my head, are always in constant conversation with one another. And um, thank you, Ivan, for wonderfully stimulating presentation on Epicurus and wonderfully stimulating questions on Epicurus. So how, how exactly should I uh, uh, pose the question? So I think the question was, you know, can we consider ataraxia as the meaning of life for Epicurus? Uh, and ataraxia means something like freedom from disturbance, maybe uh, Sanskrit word nirvana, I feel, is uh, 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 a close analog. Um, and, and more specifically, yeah, like this. Can you consider ataraxia as the meaning of life, or, or nirvana for that matter? And what is the, what is the purpose of the Epicurean garden? you know, purpose of the garden. How, what, 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 what on earth does this have to do with Heidegger and Lacan? Well, I agree with Plato that in philosophy, every question is actually connected with every other question. So hopefully, you know, the connections will become clear in a moment. Um, and I guess my immediate attempt to, to, to answer this question is the following. Um, it's strange to think of ataraxia as the meaning of life. Very interestingly, again, Callicles asks this question to Socrates in the dialogue Gorgias. So Callicles asks 
asks Socrates. So ataraxia means freedom from disturbance, freedom from disturbance, freedom from perturbation, freedom from pain. But it's it's a negative ideal. It's freedom from, it's absence of negative emotion, negative feeling, absence of bodily and mental pain. And so Callicles, I think quite legitimately, asks Socrates, Socrates, but if ataraxia is the meaning of life, aren't stones and corpses the happiest of all people? In fact, aren't stones and corpses happier than people? Shouldn't you just go and I don't know, kill yourself? By the way, sorry, suicide is not a joke. If you're not feeling well, seek professional help. This is a class in philosophy. I am not a professional psychologist. Seek help, please. Uh, I'm not sure if these are the best words to use, but again, unfortunately, I know from experience this is a complicated topic, but sometimes philosophy requires we talk about complicated and dangerous topics. Anyway, so this is a Calaclean challenge. And I feel that in an important respect, my own personal answer to this question would be that probably it's not the right thing to think of ataraxia as the meaning of life. Because to do philosophy is to be first a skeptic. So skeptic first. Mm. Epicurean second. Skeptic first, Epicurean second. Skeptic first, Buddhist second. Skeptic first, Nietzschean second. Skeptic first, Marxist second. To do philosophy is to be a skeptic. What does it mean to be a skeptic? To be a skeptic means to resist the temptation to jump to conclusions. Resist the temptation to jump to conclusions. Again, the Greek word epoche. So not jump uh, to conclusions. The Greek word is epoche, which means something like bracketing out or suspension of judgment. Ah, sexus empiricus. Say hi to sexus empiricus. Wonderful, Sextus Empiricus up here, together with the Buddha. I feel, you know, if you take Sextus and Epicurus, you're mostly going to get something like the Buddha. Um, so, let me try to continue. Um, so, it's like, we don't say that ataraxia is the purpose of existence, but you wake up, and in some sense, you see, when I do lectures in philosophy, very often I feel this... Uh, desire, this temptation to do a first lecture in philosophy. Like every lecture I do, I want to do it as if this is the first lecture. So I don't know. I don't know who am I talking to right now. This this, this is live, stream, live streamed on YouTube, right? And um, by the way, I'm not sure. It's like, you know, disclaimer, I'm not a fan of YouTube. I am not a fan of YouTube, but it seems to be the easiest way to get information to students these days. If anybody knows of a better alternative, let me know. But so far, every every other alternative I tried, you know, is imperfect from technical problems. YouTube is just so streamlined. Anyway, sorry, go back a step. So I, I have this temptation to do a first lecture every time. So every class, like, ask ourselves, like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And in on some sense, maybe that's not very productive. But in another sense, I think it is very productive. It is very important. It is very important to uh, to get into this reflective mood, to take nothing for granted. And especially if the Buddhists are right, if somebody like Vasubandhu is right, and there's no such thing as permanent self, if the soul does not exist, then technically speaking, I am not the same person I was yesterday. It's as if like you're co constantly waking up for the first time. This is, this is, you know, Buddhism, Buddhism, the word Buddha means awakened one, uh, uh, right? So it's like you're constantly waking up. It's like uh, Heidegger talks about how you know we find ourselves thrown into this world. We emerge from the unconsciousness of early babyhood, but we also emerge from the unconsciousness of you know early morning, from the unconsciousness of the previous moment. Again, this experience of constantly finding yourself conscious, right? And this metaphor of waking up from sleep. And I feel I feel this is such a such a such an important metaphor, right? That um, um, like while you are asleep, the dream feels real, but then you find yourself waking up, and you have this moment of incredulity. What was I doing before? It seemed real, but now I realize it's not. 
It's a deeply disconcerting enterprise. But I feel, again, to, to, to get into this mindset of constantly waking up as if you woke up a second ago, as if you were born a second ago, and if you're starting doing philosophy for the first time, I feel that there's something valuable, at least for me in my stage of intellectual development at this moment, of, of doing philosophy like that, of like having every class be the first class in philosophy in some sense. And, you know, every September I see new students, right? Uh, 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 and, uh, um, you know, I starting, uh, like, doing history of philosophy as a way of doing philosophy, seeing first-year students for the first time and introducing them to philosophy for the first time. I feel there's deep value to that. Let me, let me uh, 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 maybe make a very strange connection. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if this is going to be clarifying or not, but recently, recently I've been thinking about this. Maybe, maybe this is actually a good analogy. You know, um, doing philosophy is a, little, is a little bit like playing chess or maybe playing some kind of strategy game. So, uh, uh, philosophy uh, as chess, right? In a sense that you always start with the same board. You always start with the same board. The pieces are all in the same place. And you got to go through the motions. You have to, like, every class, I feel I have to go through the same opening, right? A student asks, asks me a question, I'm not sure what their prejudices are. I'm not sure what my prejudices are. We have to establish this connection. We have to try to establish this dialogue. Maybe, for me, in my head, a better analogy would be like, uh, uh, st you know, computer strategy games. So maybe not chess, but something like, I don't know, Age of Empires, or maybe, you know, Starcraft, uh, uh, right? It's like, Age of Empires is more familiar strategy game for me, but it's like, uh, uh, you, uh, I, I really, I really like this. Like in in Age of Empires, you always start in the Dark Age. You always start in the Dark Age. Mm, I feel there's a beautiful metaphor for for doing philosophy in here. And it's like like you you have to build houses, you have to find your first boar, you have to you know lure deer, you know scout around, and you know it's it's a little bit like like teaching a philosophy class. Mm -hmm. You have to go through the same motions, establish the same argument step by step with, with every new person. And, like, and every class is like a new match. And you always, like, you always start in dark age. Uh, if this metaphor is not very clear, uh, you know, think of chess. Maybe, maybe chess is a better analogy for you. However, I have to tell you that my knowledge of chess is quite limited. Uh, tragically, lamentably, very shameful fact about me. I understand age vampires better than I understand chess. Mm. Anyway, let me try to maybe, you know, this is free form. This is freestyle in many ways. Again, I told you, we're in the middle of a dark and depressing November. So this is this is my attempt, to, again, to, trying to go back to, uh, um, uh, to Ivan's presentation this morning. So is ataraxia the meaning of life? It is, what is the purpose of the garden? And I want to say that in many ways, again, like we find ourselves every moment emerging from the unconsciousness of our past lives. We find ourselves always, like as if for the first time, acquiring self-consciousness. And again, if Vasubandhu is right, if contemporary physics is right, if this formula can be taken seriously, then in some important respect, from moment to moment, you are a new person. It's like, uh, the, the constellation of atoms constantly reproduces your consciousness and you look like the person you were yesterday, but you are not ontologically the same person that you were yesterday. There's no such thing as permanent soul that exists. I inherit something from my past self the same way I inherit something from my parents. It's like I was thrown into this world with my past memories, my past skills, for example, with my skill of speaking English, right, or knowing philosophy, in the same, and I haven't chosen that, right, I find myself with that. In a similar fashion, uh, um, it's like I was born in a particular country, like I was born on planet Earth, I didn't choose to be born on planet Earth, I was thrown into this existence again. Trying to get to Heidegger. So what I'm driving at is that I feel that ataraxia or nirvana is not the meaning of life or the goal in life. Like you, you wake up in the morning and most people don't feel very good about themselves. Now, very often people have to rush. This is the problem with capitalism. We are constantly in a rush. You know, there's no time to pause, relax, and think about what the hell we're doing, right? You got you got places to be, you got children to feed. No time to take a moment and reflect, right? It's a luxury to be able to do philosophy. Luxury, which is tragically 
unavailable to most people. Now, there's a hope in the project of enlightenment that we can extend this luxury and that society will be better because of this. And, you know, Hegel and Marx, for example, believe and hope that extending this luxury, making everybody an expert, making everybody a philosopher, especially in Marx, is going to stabilize society. It's going to allow, Marx imagines, communism is going to be the first society in which we're going to have no ideology, in which human life is going to be transparent to humans, and human social life is going to be transparent to society. Society free from ideology is very, kind of, very highfalutin hope. But anyway, let me, let me, I'm still trying to go back to Epicurus, right? Um, so it's like, for Buddha and for Epicurus, you find yourselves with problems. And these problems need solutions. So it's not like somehow dogmatically you think that Epicurus or Buddha are like prophets from gods who have truth with capital T. No. My uh, understanding of uh, uh, Epicurus and Buddha is, uh, is broadly speaking, I don't know, like proto-existentialist. In, in many ways, I feel that Epicurus and Buddha are more interesting than the existentialist philosophies. But, you know, we can think of maybe uh, Nietzsche, right? So, for me, Epicurus and Buddha have the Nietzschean insights before Nietzsche. Life has no meaning. This is, uh, there are no capital V values, right? We, we find ourselves thrown into this world. Our existence is an issue for us. And we're trying to make this life slightly more palatable. We find ourselves with beliefs, you know, with beliefs, values, and desires, especially with desires, right? If you have a splintering headache, you don't need a separate argument to establish that the headache is bad. Your body takes over and makes you try to stop the headache. In a similar fashion, I feel for, for Buddha or for Epicurus, you wake up in the morning and you, and you find life tragically unpalatable and you try to make it more palatable. And so you are led to do things that allow you you know, a calmer, more composed state of mind. But it's not, it, it's strange to say it's the meaning of life. It's like the purpose of your existence. It's something that we are led to do. And like in many ways, I want to, I'm trying to get to Heidegger in some sense, right? But Heidegger wants to say that all this mentalistic jargon of plans is a bit misleading because, yes, of course, we plan sometimes, but we plan against the background of things that we don't plan, against the background of basic dispositions with which we find ourselves. We are thrown into this world. It's like, in many ways, this is the... It's like people talk about Camus and Sartre. I feel Heidegger, philosophically, is a deeper philosopher than Camus and Sartre, and I don't want to pick fights. I'm sorry, maybe this sounds too controversial. But it's like, you know, Camus... It talks about this uh, uh, myth of Sisyphus and talks about how life is meaningless. Well, didn't Epicurus already know that life is meaningless? Again, this phrase from Kant, the Schlund des Zwecklosen Chaos der Materie. The universe is the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. This seems to be like a description of the Epicurean cosmos, right? No capital V values, but small V values, trying to make life more palatable. And what is the purpose of the garden? The purpose of the garden is like, it's therapeutic, it's medical. You have a problem, I have a problem. Let's get together and let's solve the problem together. People, it's like, from Epicurus to Adam Smith, there's this consensual project. Like, one of the problems that we have is that we are thirsty and hungry. And if we get together in a community of friends, it's easier to satisfy our thirst and hunger. Community of friends, right? From from Epicurus, uh, let's say from Epicurus to Adam Smith to Karl Marx. From Epicurus to Adam Smith to Karl Marx. This is this is the hope that, you know, I'm hungry, you are hungry, and getting together helps us satisfy our hunger better. And not to mention that, again, Epicurus is going to say one of the greatest joys in life, a characteristically... So you have uh, uh, static and catastimatic pleasures. So characteristically static... Um, so it's mm, static dynamic, catastimatic, kinetic. Okay, yeah, catastimatic, yeah. So, so catastic, mm, doesn't matter. So static pleasure, characteristically static pleasure, tranquil pleasure, static, tranquil pleasure. I'm mis mix mixing up ideology here, a little, um, terminology here a little bit. So static, tranquil pleasure is the pleasure of conversation between friends. Isn't this what I'm doing right now? Why am I recording this lecture right now? It is, I insist, my free choice to be a uh, 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 professor of philosophy. And the reason I make this free choice 
is because hopefully thank i don't know thankfully it makes my life better it makes my existence slightly more palatable this is a very strange conversation because i'm talking to a camera but on the other side of this camera there are students and i'm some of you are going to talk to me online tomorrow but some of you i'm going to see face to face hopefully in january so this is this is a conversation this is my side of the conversation this is my letter this is my letter to you colleagues who are going to talk back to me thankfully ho hopefully thankfully thankfully in the past hopefully in the future right we will continue this conversation um and there's this i feel very important insight about passivity right how in kind of from from epicurus to buddha to Lao Tzu to heidegger can this idea that it's not like I have a plan and I'm trying to bring this plan into, into, into the world, as, as Descartes would say, this mentalistic Cartesian picture. No, in an important sense, Heidegger would say, I observe being existing through me. I am this uh, Lichtung. I am this uh, clearing in the, through which being shines. Mm. Many different ways to explain this. The simplest way is... You are listening to my words like right now. I am listening to my words right now. If this formula is right, there's this neuronal structure in my head which <laughs> quasi-reflexive fashion just produces these words. You are listening to me. I am listening to myself. A bit of an interesting kind of uh, uh, reflective, introspective meditation. Mm, detaching myself from my speech. Mm, words. Words are limited. Words never capture reality fully. In an important sense, language always lies. Lies in the sense of misrepresenting reality. Language, linguistic concepts are always a simplification. Mm. Deep insight in Epicurus and Buddha. Maybe in Howard Phillips Lovecraft as well. One of my students is going to do a presentation of Lovecraft. Uh, Valeria, I think. Looking, very much looking forward to that presentation. Uh, but between Lovecraft and, and Heidegger. Being open to the fundamental mystery of existence. Fundamental openness to the fundamental mystery of existence. Poetic in Heidegger, frightening and terrifying in Lovecraft. But I feel, maybe, two sides of the same story. Mm. What is all this? What is all this? I mean, uh, in some sense, I think, between Lovecraft and Heidegger, you could say that the entirety of human civilization is an attempt to get away from the, the fundamental terror, the fundamental Lovecraftian horror behind, uh, not behind, but in front... Mm, before, right? So, so human beings are terrified of existence, terrified of existence. And so we try to create this world of artifacts and treat everything like an artifact. Go into the woods and do not see, this is also Heideggerian insight, go into the woods and do not see the primeval terrifying forest, but see timber, timber to be harvested, to be used as resource. See everything as an artifact. So these words in Heidegger, Gestell und Bestand, standing reserve, standing resource, capitalism, efficiency for the sake of efficiency, instrumental rationality, something that, that Weber talks about. Instrumental rationality as an attempt to escape the fundamental terror of existence. Mm -hmm. The thoughts, the thoughts that keep me up at night. Hmm. So, um, did, am I, am I, is this a good answer to uh, 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 Ivan's question in the morning? Ataraxia is the meaning of life, purpose of the garden. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But let me, let me continue. Let me try to maybe uh, uh, give a different take on this. So, um, so Marx talks about capitalism. But I want to ask, what can specifically um, Lacan, Freud, and Heidegger... So Lacan, who is Freud plus Heidegger, <laughs> this is an oversimplification, but you will forgive me, colleagues, for this gross oversimplification. Uh, what can Lacan, what kind of Freudian and Heideggerian insights can Lacan bring to clarify Marx? And I want to say Marx, like the, the ultimate insight of Marx, I feel is that, you know, capitalism is this horrible, enslaving, structural drive, structural drive of, of, of efficiency 
for the sake of efficiency. I cannot spell at all this time of day. So uh, coercive laws of market competition, but also also something I mentioned in Coursera, especially Marxists after Marx are going to focus on coercive laws of market competition and coercive laws of competition between sovereign states. So coercive laws of com you know corporate competition and state competition of corporate plus state competition. This is why um, it's a gross misunderstanding, I feel, of Marx to see this dichotomy between state and market. States can be oppressive, markets can be oppressive. You know, state capitalism is just as bad as market capitalism. Marx tries to save the space of free and equal discussion, what, what uh, Jürgen Habermas is going to call uh, civil society, strong public. Right? or strong and weak public, pu public sphere, right? Uh, free and equal discussion in the public sphere. This is what, this is what Marx is talking about, kind of this uh, quasi-ancient Greek idea of maybe something like direct participatory democracy against the coercive laws of market and state competition. Complicated words. I, I cannot, I, I'm tr unfortunately, I'm trying to talk about everything at the same time, but let me go back. But in addition to the structural analysis, this is Marx, this is Marx. But I feel what Lacan is going to say is that in addition to this structural analysis of capitalism, we also need a psychological analysis, uh, analysis of, you know, structural analysis of human psychology. And so we have this drive of efficiency for the sake of efficiency, but it takes advantage of a particular kind of uh, uh, feature of human psyche. And I feel that, there's, that there should be an evolutionary psychological explanation. Uh, now, obviously, Heidegger and Freud and Lacan know nothing about evolutionary psychology, but I feel that the basic insights of evolutionary psychology, modular theory of the mind, are compatible and reinforce Laca Lacanian conclusions. Um, but the ultimate idea is that, you see, there's this, you know, Heidegger and Freud are going to say that Life, and, and Buddha knows this before Heidegger and Freud, life is, fun, is fundamentally unsatisfactory. Buddha calls this dukkha. Life is unsatisfactory. And Freud and Heidegger know this. Uh, uh, I think Freud is going to talk about how human beings are driven creatures. Creatures, creatures is a bad word. We're not creatures, we're beings. Uh, Freud will say that we are driven beings. We're driven. We have drives. I think it's Triebe in German, right? And these drives can never be satisfied. It's kind of insatiable, unclear desire at the root of our existence. And Heidegger is going to talk about maybe anxiety, Sorge. Uh, um, anxiety, care, uh, gr maybe groundlessness, right? So, but our existence is unsatisfactory. And so what happens is that I feel that there's this kind of Darwinian, evolutionary, psychological uh, substitution that goes on. And, and uh, Lacan calls this objet petit a. Uh, so this is this is a cryptic phrase which explains nothing. So I apologize uh, for using technical jargon, but this is this this is objet, objet petit objet petit a. This metonymic sliding of desire, metonymic sliding of desire. And the objet petit a is the elusive object of desire, right? So the idea is that in some sense, ultimately what human beings want is we want to be happy and we want to not die. But that's impossible. And so our psychology tricks us and says, well, actually, if you do X, Hmm. Well, if you achieve A, if you gain this objet petit A, then your life will finally be complete. Okay, this is not a very good color to use. I'm sorry. Let me try again. Maybe this is a better color. Yeah. So if, if I get this A, this object A, object small A, objet, objet petit A, this is what it means in... 
uh, uh, in French. Then my life will be complete. And what can objet petit a be? It can be, uh, you know, a new car. Or, it, well, let's, let's start with the simplest example, because, you know, ever since we are children, it could be a new toy. Notice, it has to be new. It's always something new, not old hat, but we're always, like, driven some, some you know, something in the future that's going to make our life complete, something that we look forward to. Like, the, the, you know, you eat chocolate, the next bite of chocolate, or you're eating chocolate, and after chocolate, you're planning to have, I don't know, a cup of coffee, or maybe the other way around, right? So, new toy, or, or, or next bite of chocolate, chocolate or something, or a new or different, or maybe your first uh, girlfriend or boyfriend, your like, love interest, like new, let's write love interest, or maybe a new house or a new job or something like that. And I feel that when sort of this Heideggerian Freudian Lacan, when sort of the, the, the Heideggerian Freudian rubber hits the Marxist road, so the connection between Marx and Lacan, when the <laughs> Lacanian rubber hits the Marxist road, is understanding that this is basically what drives capitalism forward. That at the back of our heads, we all, to the extent that we're complicit in the capitalist system, we all have this hope that if we buy into the capitalist game, if we sell ourselves, if we sell our labor power to the highest bidder, if we become slaves to the system, slaves to wage, then we'll be able to buy our way, buy our way, buy a new toy for ourselves, buy the next bite of chocolate, or very often, tragically and lamentably, Marx is going to say, bourgeois families just legalized form of prostitution. Very often, it's like it's a very unpalatable fact of life, but it's true, to, unfortunately. Uh, is that, you know, so so much of human love life is a transaction. Like, I am going to give you uh, a house, a car, uh, a monthly allowance, and, uh, uh, like, as, as a payment for that, you will maybe love me, comfort me, I don't know, hug me, uh, kiss me, have sex with me, right? or provide physical physical and emotional comfort, like quip pro quo, quip pro quo. But that, what I'm driving at is that so much of love life under capitalism is, is a crass transaction, which is rooted in material interest. You know, so many families only stay together because they cannot afford to break up. It's a deeply tragic fact of our existence. But the Heideggerian, so let me m maybe make this a new slide, So let's and let's focus on this metonymic sliding of desire. Uh, should I explain this phrase? So metonymy, it's like a uh, metonymy, like metaphor. It's like I'm gonna achieve A, and A is gonna allow me to achieve my meaning of life. So like you, hmm? metonymy basically substitution. You substitute the meaning of life for getting a new car or something like that, or getting a new toy. I don't know, new Lego set. Um, But the fundamental, I think, Freudian, Heideggerian, and Lacanian insight, and maybe Marxist insight as well, Buddhist insight, is that you cannot uh, uh, buy happiness. You cannot marry into happiness. You cannot steal your way to happiness. You cannot cheat your way to happiness. You cannot, you know, graduate your way to happiness. Right? Like... Ultimately, again, 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 like th this notion of metonymy, right, is that something is a substitute or a metaphor for something else. So, for example, you know, like in Shakespeare, Romeo says, Juliet is the son. Juliet is not the son. He says Juliet is the son, but Juliet is not the son. So, in a similar fashion, we say, a new car will make my life complete, but, this, but it's not. It's not. Juliet is not the sun, and the new car will not make your life complete. You, you buy, I don't know, a Mercedes or a Porsche Cayenne, and your life is not going to be complete. So Daniel Kahneman, very crass, I feel, very banal, you know, sort of, to refer to Kahneman you know, when I'm talking about Freud, Heidegger, and Buddha, but, you know, the economists know this. Um, so, 
again, this metonymic sliding of design. So, like, in some sense, our desires point beyond the possibility of our experience. The object of our, the, the real object of our desire is always on the other side of any possible of any possible human experience. The object of our desire is on the other side of any possible experience. This is what this word of metonymic sliding of desire means, and this is why sort of um, you know again like this, this fundamental mistake that our brain makes, this fundamental illusion that we have. Oh, if only I could get this job, this car, this spouse, if I could get together with this boyfriend or girlfriend, finally my life would be complete. But no, it doesn't work that way. You get it, you get a new toy, and it becomes old hat the next moment. Right? So this is this is kind of what it means, metonymic And the metonymic sliding of desire is that it constantly slides onto the next object. Mm, so let's let's try to maybe clarify this metaphor a little bit more. So mm -hmm. Romeo says, Juliet is the sun. But if they actually get together, they don't in the story, but if they could get together, he would realize, no, Juliet is not the son. And there's going to be a new girl, and he will think, oh, no, she is the son. Right? So this metonymic sliding of desire. So his desire will slide through Juliet, through the next girl, and the next girl, and the next girl, and he's never going to be, Romeo is never going to be satisfied, because it's impossible for human beings to be satisfied, ever. Because our desires do not point to any possible objects that can be objects of our experience. They point beyond our experience. Lacan talks about these three registers. Um, so, <laughs> I did not rehearse this. So, I'm doing this from memory. So, it's... Oh, oh this is going to be difficult. So, imaginary, uh, symbolic... What's the third one? Real. Hopefully. So, the way I understand this, is this going to be any kind of clarification? Not sure, but we'll try. We'll see. <laughs> Livestream par excellence. So, imaginary basically refers to Kantian phenomena. Phenomena of experience. Something that is present to our experience. Symbolic is the way it is descri described in language. But in an important sense, especially our experience, but more importantly, our language, points beyond. So, basically, you know, Kantian noumena. Noumena or noumenon, however you want to call that. Right? Things in themselves. So, again, let's try to explain this, right? So, it's like, I have this experience, which is life is unsatisfactory. Mm, human beings are anxious, mostly unconscious products of larger forces, of biological and cultural evolution. We are manufactured by these forces as driven beings to never be satisfied, right? But to fulfill certain function in the perpetuation of the logic of these systems of biological and cultural evolution. And we want things that we do not really need. And the things that we really need are the things that we cannot, in principle, get. Let me explain this last part. So, I find myself, my life being unsatisfactory. This is on the level of imaginary, of, of the imaginary. So, in my head, don't worry about these words too much. I'm trying to, <laughs> to make them more clear. So, like, in terms of the phenomena of my experience, I feel dissatisfaction. Now, notice, I say dissatisfaction... But that's a word. I'm not communicating my dissatisfaction to you. I'm using a symbolic re register. So dissatisfaction as it appears to me in my first-person experience, which is actually first-person experience in itself is incommunicable. I cannot communicate it to you. And you cannot communicate it to me. This is a bit of a this solipsistic issue, right? So this, like dissatisfaction, but first-person dissatisfaction. So first-person private in communicable. So, an example. An example is dissatisfaction. As it is experienced. Yeah. Then, 
I describe it in language. And so I, I say the word dissatisfaction. I can say the word dissatisfaction. And my t I tell myself a certain story. And you see, this is the issue. This is why, this is why I want to read more Lao Tzu and I want to read more Buddha. Because the, the ancient Taoists and the ancient Buddhists understand the limits of human language. The ancient Greeks, I also feel, understand limits of human language. People like Heraclitus or Xenophanes or even Socrates, probably Plato as well, understand the limit of human language. Language, in some sense, is always a misinterpretation of reality because it's a, simplifi or an over an, a tragic oversimplification and maybe overgeneralization of reality. Language always lies to us. Lies is a complicated word, judgmental word, misrepresents reality. So I say the word dissatisfaction and I have a certain narrative, a story I say in my own head, right? And this story points to something beyond my experience. For example, it points... So the, the, the word dissatisfaction points to, to a concept, to a linguistic concept. And the linguistic concept is satisfaction. <laughs> Let's say, possibility of satisfaction. Um, but the problem is that this concept of satisfaction can never be present to my consciousness. It's not in the cards. It's one of those regulative ideas. And you have these, um, again, important piece of Lacanian terminology, transcendental signifiers. These magical words. Uh, uh, and the example of transcendental signifiers could be uh, so these, these are words that point beyond experience. These could be God or reality or happiness, satisfaction, you know, etc. And the idea is that these are, these are magical words. They're supposed to like hack your brain. And, and, and they, they do. For most people, they do hack their brains, right? And they, they point to something beyond experience. This, again, the real, the real, Kantian noumena. Something that can never be really an object of our experience. As Kant says that God can never be an object of our experience. Or reality, as it is, the Kantian noumena can never be an object of our experience. This is why, incidentally, I feel it's very important to read Kant carefully. Even though I disagree with half the things that Kant says, also there are some deep and important insights in Kant. Mm. And so, again... Um, the metonymic sliding of desire operates on these three registers. So satisfaction is, be, is, is real, is real, is in the realm of the real. It is beyond any possible experience. Our experience points to it, but we can never really achieve it. And so we have a symbol. A symbol is like a pointer, it's like an arrow, which says on it, like, let's say, meaning of life. So it points to something beyond itself. A, a linguistic concept points beyond itself to the real. But because it can never be achieved, you, you have this, you get this metonymic sliding because you get this new thing, but it's not the thing. It's never the thing. And tragically, and it's like, again, on the one hand, we have the, the deep psychologists, Freud, Heidegger, Lacan, Buddha, Epicurus. But on the other hand, we have Marx, a social theorist, right? And I want to see the two together. I want the Lacanian rubber to hit the Marxist road, right? So for most people, unfortunately, alive on planet Earth today, this realization, what, what I have on my slides over here, yeah, these things, these insights are not available because they are poor. They are slaves to the capitalist system. They will never be able, they will never be able to wake up this is why I find Gnosticism, I, I disagree metaphysically with the Gnostics, but this is why I find Gnosticism such a tragically true metaphor for, uh, uh, for human life as I see it outside the window. Again, the Gnostics would say most people are like bubbles in the river of oblivion. Bubbles in the river of oblivion. I think uh, there's this um, Greek word plasma, plasma. 
So most, the consciousness of most people is like plasma, the froth, in the waves of Lethe, the river of oblivion. Most people live their lives never acquiring consciousness for a single moment. It's not their fault. That's the world, that's the tragic world we live in. The abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. You, you know, atoms seeking lowest energy states, inex, you know, the universe inexorably moving towards the heat death or something like that. Whoops. Uh, we seek lasting satisfaction, but it's unavailable to us. The fate that awaits all of us is, again, lowest energy states. Heat death of the universe, maximum entropy. Der Schlund des Zwecklosen Chaos der Materie. So, but most people, again, tragically and lamentably, never have a chance to wake up. Doing philosophy is luxury. And when people ask me, why should you do philosophy? As years go by, I find this more and more a tragic question, a very tragic question to ask, which makes me sad and makes me want to cry in many ways. Like, literally, literally, tears on my eyes. But let me, let me try to go back to kind of Lacan, Freud, and Heidegger, right? So, uh, again, most people never have a chance to experience these, this sliding from imaginary to symbolic to the real. But if you are one of the few people, and, unf you know, like, again, <sighs> unpalatable facts, you know, a moment of unpalatable truth in the lecture. I am bourgeois, a scholar of Marxist, but also a bourgeois, a scholar of Marxist, but also very clearly an exploiter. These hands have blood on them. I'm talking to you through a microphone. Who made this microphone? Where did the material come from for this microphone? It's very fashionable, you know, to use strong language and talk about you know, the Germany during the Second World War as the epitome of uh, some kind of horrible, un inhuman society. And to think of how could the Germans permit th these kinds of atrocities? Well, people, let's look ourselves in the mirror. Children will die from cancer because this microphone is possible. It's a tragic, unpalatable fact of life. I'm not sure I should be saying these words. Maybe it's not pedagogical, but you know, you know, sometimes, as Rick Roderick says, you, you gotta say, you gotta tell the truth <laughs> once in a while. Maybe I'll find a better, more enlightened, more mindful way to talk about these things, more productive, more pedagogical way. But it's it's a useful reminder. You know, maybe I will be listening to this lecture at some point in the future, and this will, you know, something will click in my head, and I will find a better way, a more palatable, more constructive way to talk about these things. But there are blood on these hands, okay? And if you are listening to this, chances are there's blood on your hands too. What should we do about this? Not clear. Not clear. I have 16 lectures on Coursera, Introduction to Political Philosophy, where I'm trying to convince you that the, the answer is not clear. Some suggestions, some suggestions, you know, with my wonderful patron saint, Antonio Gramsci, Pessimismo dell'intelligenza, Ottimismo della volontà. Pe you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, yes, but there are blood on our hands. Machiavelli is right. There's no such thing as clean hands. No such thing as clean hands in politics. Talking about too many things. But I'm trying to get back to Lacan. So, I am bourgeois. And most of my students are bourgeois. So we have a chance to look at this picture and see this picture. It's like... I have many stupid examples. They're stupid and silly and crass. Uh, many years ago, five, seven, I forget, uh, when I was younger and less ambitious, I was walking past a Lego store and there was a toy. It was a Lego airplane and I wanted it. It was quite expensive. Back in the day, couldn't quite afford it very easily. I kept walking and looking at it. I already, you know, it's like I was already teaching philosophy. So as a and and doing yoga. So as a as a mindful meditator, I noted that if I ever get this toy airplane, uh, you know, yes, yes, I'm a grown man <laughs> talking about toy airplanes. Yes, this is this is what this the, the lecture has come down to. But bear with me, bear with me. We all probably all have examples of something like this. Um, 
So being a meditator, I knew what to expect. And having read Daniel Kahneman, I knew what to expect. That the moment I get the toy, it will become the old hat. It will cease. Like, I feel that it's going to make my life complete, but actually it won't. So, uh, obviously what, what happened is that I didn't, you know, it's like I, I, could, I didn't have the guts to get it for myself, but my wife got it for me for my birthday. And I was ecstatic. And all of my friends were horrified and thought that something might be wrong, might be wrong with me, that I work, clearly work too much. And I haven't had a vacation in a long time. Because when they come to my house, I spend, you know, 20 minutes showing them the beautiful airplane and describing it and telling them what, what it can do and cannot do. But of course... Time passes. In a couple of days, the airplane has become old hat. And it's still... I should have brought it with me. I'm not going to pause the live stream for this. But, you know, remind me sometimes. I'll, I'll show you because I still have it. And I look at it right now and zero emotion. Like, it gives me absolutely no satisfaction. And, you know, this is the fundamental illusion. Back when I got it, back when I got it as a present, was so happy, was so grateful to my wife... Back when I got it, I, I knew, my conscious brain, my philosophical brain knew that it will become an, an old hat. And David Hume has this phrase of useless toys, worthless toys, that people uh, uh, steal and cheat and they trade away the happiness of a clear conscience for acquiring useless toys. And, you know, for me, the airplane was a useless toy, right? But, but my, con my conscious brain told me that I'm going to be, you know, indifferent to the worthless story the next day. But, but my experiential brain, my imaginary consciousness, right, the, the I don't know, the, the feeling, the first person consciousness could not imagine this in my head. It, 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 it seemed, like, cognitively I understood this, but it seemed, experientially, it seemed unthinkable. Of course, it's such a beautiful plane, it will always be satisfactory. It, it will always bring me joy and pleasure. But of course it did not. It became an old hat. Another example, a more serious example, is uh, uh, about, I think something like five years ago now, I got my first lecturing position. And uh, uh, like, I did many lectures before then, and I did some one-time courses, but for the first time this was a regular lecturing position in the course of modern political theory. A course which to many, to a large extent, has defined my life since then. And when I got it, I thought to myself, wow, this is amazing. And again, it's like, um, in many ways, I, like my philosophical career was shaping up uh, in the wake of the crisis, economic crisis of 2008. And ever since 2008, philosophy departments have been closing all over the world. F philosophy and humanities depart departments are getting defunded. So I actually never, never really uh, uh, expected to be able to have any kind of teaching job as a, as a philosopher, not to mention a lecturing position, right? But being a Lacanian and a meditator, I knew that some time will pass, maybe a year, and my lecturing position will become old hat. When I first heard the news, when for the first time the you know the representative of the, of the department offered me this position, I was ecstatic beyond words. I thought that finally my life would be different, that this would be a life-changing experience. And you know what? No, no, it it did absolutely nothing. It's like um, I'm not sure if I should talk about this now, but it's like. Maybe some other time I'll do a live stream or whatever, a lecture on mental health issues or something like that. I don't know. It's an important part, right? So it's like I have uh, depressive tendencies in my psychology, maybe a as a result of me growing up in Russia in the 90s, whatever. But it's like, you know, I was prone to depression. I got depression before. Well, depression is a strong clinical word. So let's say depressive mood, depressive episodes. I had depressive episodes before I was offered the lecturing position and after I was offered the lecturing position. And the, the fact, it's like when you wake up in the morning and you feel depressed and you don't feel like getting out of bed, the fact that you have a nice car or a nice toy or a lecturing position in a university does nothing for you. This is the insight. This is the insight of Lacan, Freud, Heidegger. And this is the insight that goes back to Epicurus and the Buddha. What does help? I'll tell you what helps. This helps.
He is not rich who has much, but he is rich who needs little. Satisfying a desire is as good, sorry, getting rid of the desire is just as good as having satisfied the desire. In an important respect, I feel that there is deep compatibility between the project of Lacan, Freud, and Heidegger and the project of the Buddha. I should mention Freud. I never get around to talking about Freud properly. I feel that the most important Freudian insight is actually seeing uh, uh, our beliefs, values, and desires as slave drivers. So, it's like, again, so we have this tripartite structure, id, ego, and superego. Uh-huh. And so the id is assaulted. So id is trying, in some sense, is trying to be, trying to achieve, I don't know, trying to not suffer, trying to achieve homeostasis, trying to find a measure of comfort. Whoops. What, what did I press? So let's say striving for... Mm. I'm sorry. Yes. Satisfaction. Just, it, it wants to be left alone. But the id, so I mean, I'm obviously talking about ego here. But the id and the superego are two slave drivers. So versus the slave drivers with pointy sticks who st who sting the ego right and there's this beautiful metaphor well beautiful but beautifully tragic metaphor from the buddhist text it's like that the most of most of the time we are like drunk monkeys stung by a spider drunk monkey stung by a scorpion in fact, by two scorpions, by two scorpions. This is a metaphor from Buddhism. Sc scorpion is a metaphor from Buddhism. Two scorpions is me trying to adapt the Buddhist metaphor to, uh, uh, to explain Freud. So one scorpion is id, which is, uh, uh, let's say, the desires of the flesh. And the other scorpion is the superego. And, and you know, or as Jean-Jacques Rousseau would put it, amour propre, right? Uh, and, and this would be the uh, demands of society. And, and both of these are painful. Both of these are painful and both of these are screaming in your head. Like, the desires of the flesh scream like, like I don't know, I'm hungry, hungry, like, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, or, you know, you know, Callicles, and when, when Socrates is talking to Callicles, they have this tragic and brutal example of a young person overcome by sexual lust, and how, when you're overcome by sexual, you know, the, the example is, uh, a young person is overcome by sexual lust. And because they're overcome by sexual lust, the Socratic question, is it you who controls your sexual desire or does the sexual desire control you? It's such a Socratic thought. It's a Buddhist thought, but I also feel it's a very Freudian thought, right? Um, and because of this, they, this young person allows themselves to be taken advantage of by somebody else, by other people, by, let's say, an older person. So you allow yourself to be taken advantage of. Somebody takes advantage of your sex, like like a drug addict. Think of think of the you know opium addicts, right? And opium and it's like I've heard a story recently of uh, this is early gold rush in America, a town which is basically run on alcohol and prostitutes. And you, you can you can you can see the uh, horrible lives of the workers in the mines who are basically you know slaves to alcohol and prostitutes. They they have to you know 
So this is this is actually this is secretly what Marx means by commodity fetishism. It's not that you exchange one value, let's say dollars, for another value, a bottle of alcohol. No, 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 no. Bottle of alcohol is like is like a head crab that attaches to your body and makes you the slave of the capitalist system. One type of labor is exchanged for another type of labor. I don't know, the, 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 the slave labor, the slave sexual labor of the prostitute is exchanged for the slave labor, physical labor of the miner. But, you know, the, the, the brain of the miner is hacked by the dopamine system, is being abused by their, you know, addiction to alcohol or addi- addiction to, I don't know, sexual gratification through like, prostitutes, right? And so, tragic examples, horrifying examples, but I'm sorry, this is philosophy. As Scheller says, das Metaphysik keine Versicherungsanstalt ist für schwache, stutzungsbedürftige Menschen. Metaphysics or philosophy is not uh, a self-help society for the poor in spirit. Sometimes when we do philosophy, we have to talk about tragic things, right? So sexual lust, and you allow yourself to be taken advantage of by somebody else again. Why am I? Why do I call myself a Marxist? Because most of the time in contemporary world, you are taken advantage of by the coercive laws of market competition, by corporations, which are really impersonal. And it, I keep it's like I am bourgeois. My most of my students are bourgeois. Probably all of my students are bourgeois. Otherwise, they would not be able to afford to sit in my classroom. Uh, capitalism alienates the workers, but capitalism also alienates the bourgeoisie. For the workers, capitalism decides. Capitalism, not capitalists, but capitalism. The system decides when you go to bed, when you wake up. For the bourgeoisie, for most people, also capitalism decides what you eat, when you go to bed. It is the YouTube algorithm or the Netflix algorithm that decides when you go to bed and what's on your mind. What are you, like? Are you why why are you seeing this lecture right now? Did you decide to watch this lecture, or was it suggested to you by YouTube algorithm? Did you decide to watch this lecture or did YouTube algorithm decide, suggest to you that maybe you should watch this? I would imagine that these kinds of videos are mostly, most of the time not suggested by YouTube algorithm. Usually YouTube algorithm suggests something else. And notice YouTube algorithm is not a, it's not a conspiracy theory. They're simply trying to maximize watch time, trying to sell advertisements. It's a, uh, purely instrumental drive of efficiency for the sake of efficiency. Anyway, but the id, uh, so I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. And the superego talks about how, you know, you know, don't do this. This is shameful. Or do this. This is the this is the proper thing to do. You know, pride and shame. The the Facebook page, the CV. Think think of think about your CV. Think about how this is going to reflect on you. And these are the two external slave drivers, right? And the, I I feel for me the deeply the most important um, the fundamental philosophical insight of Freud is to see the desires of the flesh and the buzzing of the superego as something external. And this is why we need to meditate. This is what we see in deep state of meditation. The sound, you could say, is external. But the feeling in your stomach, the feeling of fear or the feeling of desire or something as simple as feeling of an itch in your leg is also in an important respect in an important respect external well everything in some sense is internal to our head because everything you know our brain operates with phenomena of consciousness but vis-a-vis us what is us what is this vanishing point of buddhist non-self anatman something that in principle you're not supposed to talk about in language but something that you're only supposed to gain insight into in a deep state of meditation. Mm. External to that. You, you are not that dissociation. Anatman, Anatman. I am not myself. I am not the picture I'm looking at right now on the screen of my monitor. I am not essentially a university professor. I am essentially... I am not essentially a male or something like that. I am not essentially a human being. I am something else. What am I exactly? It's hard to say. Again, if this formula is right, I'd say that I am something like an emergent property of my of certain portions of my brain. Wh- who is talking to you? 
what is talking to you? It's a deep question. I'm not sure if I have a coherent answer, but I feel that the, the, the question is good. Hmm. So, chaos, chaotic lecture. Start from nowhere, go to nowhere. Let me try to go back. So, the purpose of this lecture was to, again, being inspired by um, uh, Ivan's question about Epicurus, to talk about Heidegger and Lacan, and to explain sort of the uh, 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 um, Epicurean insight in terms of Heidegger and Lacan. So let's, let's, let's try to summarize. So, we find ourselves, and I, I feel that, I feel that uh, uh, Epicurus would agree with what I'm typing on the board. We find ourselves thrown into this world without a manual. But we also find ourselves thrown into the situation, hmm, Heidegger, Situa what, what are you? You are the situation, Dasein. We find ourselves in a situation which is unsatisfactory. If you want, I could say, I find myself. What am I? What is myself? Right. So, In, a, in an important sense, it's like a, impersonal. It's, it's like, cogito ergo sum is a bad way of phrasing it. It's not like, I think, therefore, I am. It's just that, like, in a, in a passive voice, existence is. I observe, uh, let's not use the word I, something is, something is happening, existence happens, being emerges, I don't know, um, you know, the, the, the situation, Dasein, is deeply unsatisfactory, profoundly unsatisfactory. And um, the social structure has a, has a way of yes. The social structure has a way of taking advantage of this unsatisfactoriness. So the social structure wants to take advantage. You know, tries. You know, takes advantage. Takes advantage of this. wants to sort of hijack, weaponize the fact that life is unsatisfactory for individual human beings and make them slaves of the system. In ancient Athens, it was, let's say, the ancient Athenian system. Uh, 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 in, you know, modern-day capitalist society, we have our modern ways <laughs> of, of taking advantage of our lives. Both for, you know, everybody is exploited, everybody is alienated, both the bourgeois and the proletariat. Everybody should read Marx. Communist revolution isn't the revenge of the poor against the rich. Communist revolution is this potential, hopeful evolution of humanity to the next stage, the first stage of human history, where human beings for the first time take control of their destiny, if that's possible. Very optimistic thoughts on the part of Marx. Anyway, um, and so, but the Epicurean insight is that the way to achieve satisfaction is not to give in to the system, but to learn, but to train yourself, but to train uh, your body to learn to control desires. And I suppose the best, in fact, probably the only way to do this is together with others. And these others would be, you know, teachers, teachers of, Epicurus doesn't know anything, I doesn't use the word yoga, but, you know, why not? Teachers of yoga, teachers of meditation, teachers of philosophy, who are going to explain atomic theory to you to dispel superstitions? Ah, Epicurean atomic theory and our contemporary atomic theory. The interesting parallels and the interesting differences. 
One day, one day, colleagues. And uh, uh, promise of another lecture, hopefully. Uh, teachers of yoga, meditation, of philosophy, of science, if you want. But also friends, people whom you work together and live together. People who, you know, together with whom you will make your own bread, make the roof under, no, above your head. And people with whom you will have beautiful conversations that will make this life slightly less unpalatable. And you see, this is, this is after Freud. This is the fundamental problem of existence. We cannot reach lasting satisfaction. The, like, we, we, there is no higher, and this is, in some sense, this is why I feel that there is this Nietzsche before Nietzsche already implicit in, uh, uh, in Epicurus. Nietzsche before Nietzsche implicit in Epicurean project, right? Epicurus already knows that life has no meaning. This is why I'm not very excited about uh, Camus and Sartre. I was excited about Camus and Sartre when I was a first-year student. But these days I feel that, again, Epicurus already knows all about this stuff, right? Um, so you will not find deep capital P purpose of life or capital M meaning of life or capital V values. As uh, one of my wonderful students, Trifon, actually said, the death of God decap decapitalizes all of our words. Death of God decapitalizes of all of our words. There are no words with capital letters after the death of God. And I feel that this insight is already true for Epicurus, who was, I feel, who you know, should be described as an atheist. Now, what this word means is slightly more complicated, but should be described as an atheist. What does the word atheist mean? Complicated terms of people. Philosophy is about seeing complexity where other people see simplicity. It's not, not a simple question. Anyway, go back a step. So, friends and teachers. Teachers help you control your desires. Friends who help you gratify the desires which cannot be, you know, imagined away. Because as much as we try to control ourselves, we still need to eat. We need sometimes shelter. And, but the conversations, we don't necessarily need them. I'm sure, you know, people can live alone. But the conversations are, you know, this, as, as Epicurus describes them as static pleasure, calm, tranquil pleasure. <laughs> uh, 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 Epicurus, I think, talks about friendship as an immortal good, immortal good, divine good. Yes. Simple pleasures available to us. What was this lecture? If not my <laughs> one-way letter to the students whom I consider my friends, or at the very least, my colleagues. Let's hope. Let's hope. Okay. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Ivan will watch this long and rambling video and will respond. But Ivan, Ivan, thank you. Thank you for the inspiration. This whole lecture was inspired by your question. Um... And again, so this is Epicurus, but the reason why Heidegger and Lacan are on the board is because I feel that Heidegger and Lacan are basically on board with this project. For Heidegger and Lacan, there's no such thing as achieving, you know, capital V values in life or like capital finding M, capital M meaning of life. You just make life slightly less unpalatable. And these insights, I feel, go back to the man himself. The Buddha, the Buddha, who is always with us, always happy to listen to our unmindful ramblings. Anyway, is this clear? I hope it is, to some extent. If it's not clear, I hope you found this stimulating, inspirational. By all means, colleagues, feel free to ask questions. I should be wrapping this up. I'll take a look at the live chat. Maybe some interesting questions. Brian says, good evening. Good evening to you, Brian. Uh, uh, Madara, if I'm, producing, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, asks, why don't we have Burke, Heidegger, and Spengler in our course? Well, not sure about Spengler, but we don't have Burke and Heidegger only because there's not enough time. Colleagues, this is why we have presentations. Do a presentation on Burke, do a presentation on Heidegger, and we will in effect, have Heidegger and Burke in our course. Mm. <laughs> Emperor Palpatine 
probably the real Emperor Palpatine, says that when he got the Death Star, he felt that his life was as complete as possible. Yes, Emperor Palpatine, but did you feel that your life was as complete as possible the next day? Or especially when the rebels destroyed your Death Star? What about that? How about that? That's the tragedy of existence. Mm. Things get damaged. Things get broken. Nothing lasts forever. Uh, Sheikh says that <laughs> this lecture is giving him a depression. Sorry, sorry, apologies. This is I feel this is this is a uh, pro- occupational hazard. If you do philosophy, you have to go through certain stages. If you want to do philosophy seriously, you have to become very uncomfortable at some points. You have to become very skeptical, and you have to feel this fundamental terror, this vertigo, feeling of loss of ground beneath your feet. Uh, David Hume talks about how, you know, like, who am I? I'm not even sure, right? So, Or, on the other hand, you know, sometimes maybe even going through certain depressive stages. Yeah, I feel that this is how we grow. I think, I feel that Hegel and his phenomenology uh, uh, has captured this uh, um, philosophy as proceeding in through these stages best. Hmm. The feline friends are saying that Happy Philosophy Day is this World Philosophy Day. I'm not sure. To me, every day is the World Philosophy Day. And SBJR says that this is great. Okay. I hope it's great. And Kartoffel Manden says hello, hello to Kartoffel as well. Okay, I'm sorry. I think we ran out of, I think I ran out of ideas and that the chat ran out of uh, 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 um suggestions so let me finish here um colleagues if you have any other questions we can continue this live in teams i hope this was stimulating i'm not sure if this was clear i'm gonna watch this and see if this was clear or not but until next time stay safe take care let's try again this is it nur der verdient sich freiheit wie das leben der täglich sie erobern muss it's a daily struggle Daily struggle to maintain mindfulness. Mm, Vasubandhu tells us that we are continuously being reborn. It's the, the first, the, it's the first day of the rest of your life. In some sense, it is the first day, the first moment of your life, having awoken for the first time. Let's t- daily struggle from moment, from day to day, from moment to moment. We have to strive to maintain mindfulness. It's a difficult thing to do, but we have to try. Let's try. Take care, colleagues, and I hope I'll see you around.